and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter for boxing related tweets. Or you can subscribe to the channel, hit that notifications button and get a new notification whenever a new video is uploaded. Let's talk boxing. Let's start off with Canelo Alvarez and all the shenanigans that are surrounded him once more. Listen, we've been told for a long time, his primary aim is to become the undisputed super middleweight champion of the world. There's only one man left standing in his way. The vast majority of us, including myself, believe that although this could be a very tricky fight, Canelo Alvarez will come out on top. So there's no reason for him to duck. It makes sense in terms of legacy, in terms of uh, a big money fight too. Listen, Caleb Plant might not be a superstar in the US. Nonetheless, it's enough to capture the imagination. And if you become the undisputed champion, it adds a whole new chapter to your legacy and it opens doors financially too. You know, you might think to yourself, can Canelo really earn any more than he's already earning? Listen, success breeds success and that brings more income. So he's got nothing to lose. However, he's been a bit of a diva. And you expect this from the cash cow to a certain extent, but there have been some demands that he put in place which seem to lead to the breakdown of talks. One of those demands, allegedly, is that he was demanding a guarantee of $28 million to make the fight occur, whether or not Caleb Plant was able to take part. In other words, if Caleb Plant was to pick up an injury or get ill, and let's face it, the way the world is today, you don't even need to be ill to be told you are ill, okay? So if you then cannot compete and they had to find a late replacement. He wanted a guarantee of $28 million. However, if the shoe was on the other foot and Canelo Alvarez was to get injured or supposedly get ill, he was told he was ill, even though he felt completely fine, Caleb Plant would have had to have waited for that fight to occur. So you're putting yourself in a position where potentially you're frozen up and you can't actually have a fight until your opponent feels that he's ready. Now, listen, you still expect Caleb Plant to jump over some hurdles to make this fight happen. It's the biggest opportunity of his career. So I'm not hypercritical about that bit from Canelo, to be honest with you. It's a bit of a deaverish demand, but these things occur. However, what then transpired is what I cannot condone from Canelo Alvarez. When it became apparent that this fight was not gonna happen, there was talk about him going up to light heavyweight and fighting the light heavyweight champion, the WBA light heavyweight champion, Dimitri Bivol, and there were talks of the light heavyweight title being on the line. Now, this is obviously a fight to whet everybody's appetite. But then the same old Canelo shenanigans come to the fore and we start to hear that he has demanded Canelo weight, a catch weight in which Dimitri Bivol would have to come down in weight to fight below the light heavyweight limit for the light heavyweight title. This is shocking. This is the fight people would love to see for these two fighters to look like this. Superb specimens, superb athletes. What you don't want to see is Dimitri Bivol defending his light heavyweight title looking like he's an extra from The Walking Dead because he's been drained too much. And we've seen this happen before. Canelo's got previous when it comes to this. He's fought middleweights for the middleweight title below the middleweight division. Now, I'm sorry, but there comes a point where you have to be critical of this. I don't care whether you're a Canelo Alvarez fan or not. I don't care. The fact of the matter is, it's bringing boxing into disrepute. There's no problem if you want to fight at super middleweight. There's no problem if you don't feel as though you're big enough to be a light heavyweight. That's cool. But then stop trying to drain these guys to fight them at a lower weight class, essentially, for the light heavyweight belt. If you want to make a catch weight because you think it's a big money fight and it's a good name to have, I'll still be critical because, you know, I'll be honest with you, if you're going to fight a guy, fight him when he's at his best. Don't try and weaken him to then claim that scalp. But... At least it's not for the light heavyweight title. When you're talking about the light heavyweight title on the line, you've got to fight at light heavyweight. Otherwise, what are we doing over here? It's ludicrous. Now, not only that, it's emerged that that fight fell through as a result of all this. And as a result of that, he was generally looking at that 7th, September 18th date and wanting to fight on that date. But that's now fallen through because they just can't agree. So what's occurred is that now Canelo Alvarez is left without an opponent for September 18th. 
Now bear in mind, this is a Mexican national holiday. So with the fight being pushed back till November now, which is what is being reported, Caleb Plant has put out a tweet for the third year in a row for a date that's reserved for him. At what point is it not everyone else's fault? And at what point does it fall on the hands of him and his team? You mean every opponent they've tried to book for the last three years is just ducking? Chill. In other words, what Caleb Plant is implying here is that it's not that everybody's afraid of Canelo. It's that he makes the, the diva-ish uh, demands. He's the one that wants us to bend over backwards to make the fight happen. Now, I'm not necessarily hypercritical about that aspect. Because although I think his demands are diva-ish, you often get that with the cash cow. I mean, look at what's going on with Anthony Joshua and Alexander Usyk. AJ has gotten a rematch clause in there guaranteed rematch now Alexander Usyk of course had to agree to this for it to be in place but he may have risked missing out on that big money fight and the legacy fight had he not accepted those terms this is a problem of course because as a mandatory you don't need to have a rematch in the contract that's one of the benefits of being a mandatory well Usyk backed down on that from what we hear now apart from that if Usyk was to win to, was to lose the fight Anthony Joshua wouldn't have to fight him in a rematch so these are the sort of advantages you expect in a way from a cash cow I don't like it you know I want to see a fair playing field but you expect it so I'm not going to hold that too much against Canelo however where it does become an issue is that if you were so upset with the breakdown of talks with Caleb Plant you just couldn't reach an agreement You've told us that that was your priority, the super middleweight undisputed championship of the world. And things must have broken down pretty significantly for you to have then moved on to Dimitri Bivol. And then you decide that you want to fight for a light heavyweight title on the condition that that light heavyweight is drained, essentially. He's not at his best. He's weakened. And when he refuses, you don't fight him. And then all of a sudden you want to go back to Caleb Plant. I mean, as a fight, Plant rather than Bivol makes more sense at this stage because he wants that undisputed title. But the fact that you walked away from that to then try and fight a weakened opponent, then when he refused to be weakened, this is what we're hearing. These are the alleged reports. You don't take the fight. That's a straight up duck. He's ducking Dimitri Bivol. Now, I think Canelo's terrific. I've said this many, many times. I think he's a wonderful fighter. I've done very detailed technical breakdowns on just how good he is and the things he does. Uh, particularly well okay I think he's brilliant but we still have to call out the things we see recently I tweeted to say that if Alexander Usyk was to beat Anthony Joshua and it's a big if but if he was to do it to me he goes straight to the number one in a pound for pound list and I got a lot of stick for that what are you talking about how can you compare his resume to Canelo's listen I'm not critical of Canelo's CV because like I said it's superb but if we're com comparing elite versus elite you have to apply context and really look at into the depths, into the incri uh, intricacies of the CV. So when we look at Canelo Alvarez's CV, we see that he's had previous for doing these sorts of things. He's had previous for wanting to drain opponents. We, the whole phrase Canelo weight came about in that way. At light middleweight, he was often the, the bigger man, okay, fighting welterweights at light middleweight. Then when he was going to fight middleweights, he was often draining those opponents and fighting natural middleweights at lower than the middleweight limit for the middleweight title. Exactly what he's trying to do now with Bivol. Now, if you look at his performances in those two divisions, yes, the majority of them were fantastic, but the Lara one was controversial. The two Golovkin ones were very controversial. There's no controversy like that in Alexander Rusik's career. Not really. I know a few people feel that Chisora got something out of that fight. I really don't see how you can think that, to be honest with you. But they certainly weren't as disputed. That certainly wasn't as disputed as those fights of Canelo's. He then moves up to super middleweight where he has been terrific. No doubt about it, right? Brilliant. But this is his moment now to close the show and take Caleb Plant. Even if it means you don't get your deaverish ways, surely this is bigger than that. Now, don't get me wrong. Caleb Plant, from, like I said, from the things I've heard, you know, the money that was being touted around, I'm sure he's trying to hold Canelo to ransom too. I'm not absolving him of responsibility because by the same token, if you want a chance at greatness, you're not going to act like a diva and demand too much money either, right? So I'm not sitting here trying to give Caleb Plant a pass here. I'm simply trying to explain that Canelo Alvarez has had things go his own way. And when he hasn't, 
he hasn't really conducted himself in a manner that's befitting of a fighter of his talent, of a unified champion who is looking to create a legacy of being the best pound for pound fighter in the world today and one of the best of all time. That's all I'm saying. And I understand there are a lot of Canelo fans out there and I appreciate a lot of people get emotionally involved with fighters, but please try to understand where I'm coming from. Do you not want to see the best fight the best? And when you do, do you not want to see both fighters at their best? Shouldn't that be the minimum requirement of what we want in order to see great fights? Now, moving on from that, let's talk about the WBC, who have brought the sport into disrepute once again. Maurizio Suleiman, absolutely embarrassing. They have demanded that anybody that is going to judge a fight, and indeed he suggested that anybody involved in a fight in a recent interview with Pep Talk UK, would have to have the postman's knock. For those of you that might not know what the postman's knock is, I suggest you check out my last two videos. Or you can go and check out Hatman's videos. After all, I have plagiarized the term from Hatman. I'm sorry, Hatman, but I'm looking for ways of not getting into trouble. So I've been calling it the postman's knock as well. Now, there is absolutely no scientific basis for this demand. If you believe in your product, as I've repeated consistently, you do not need to demand that others also accept your product. Now, Dan Rayfield, rather than doing what reporters are supposed to do, has, of course, celebrated this story. We have seen this consistently over the last year and a half or two years, reporters acting like cheerleaders rather than doing what they're supposed to be doing and asking the tough questions about how there's no scientific basis behind this. So when I told Mr. Rayfield that this was discriminatory and had no scientific basis to it, he decided to block me on Twitter. Well, I'm sure I'm going to live and survive without the scintillating tweets of Dan Rayfield. But the thing is, if you're that concerned about this particular issue and your health, both you and Maurizio Suleiman, I would suggest you really consider changing your lifestyle because you are currently perhaps not in the best possible position to be able to face up uh, something like this, right? Something like what is affecting the world at the moment. Surely, if you're that afraid, you need to take those measures to put yourself in that best possible position rather than discriminating against others, get yourself into a state whereby you're capable of dealing with whatever comes your way in this regard. Now, moving on from that, but still on this same topic, in that last video, I spoke about the fighters that might potentially walk away from the sport. And there's been a very interesting interview with Michael Hunter. Well, what he came out and said is that it's 50-50 among the fighters he knows with regards to those that have accepted the postman's knock. Remember I was telling you how a lot of elite level fighters and even fighters that have yet to show their hand could walk away from the sport? You can find this interview on Boxing Scene. He goes on to say, it's a very sensitive topic because you have a split where some people agree with the postman's knock and some don't. It's just a lot of mess out there. So I think everybody should take precautions as far as, you know, cleanliness, being sanitary and just doing their due diligence with their own health. Think about what he's saying, right? Do your due diligence with your own health. I was just explaining to somebody that just because you lift a lot of weights and your physique looks good, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in good health. But then I know seven people that have had the postman's knock and then got the thing that the postman's not supposed to protect you from after that. So it's a very touchy subject. Now, I don't know whether he's had the postman's knock or not, but the takeaway point here is that he's telling you that there's a 50-50 split. This really could, this topic could decimate the sport of boxing and the fabric of society as a whole. So I know a lot of people don't like us talking about this, they get frustrated, particularly those that are pro the postman's knock. That's cool, okay? Nobody's told you you're not allowed to take it if that's what you feel is best for you. But when you start to see these demands on other people, you're going to ruin society and you're going to ruin the sport of boxing. Bear that in mind. There is no scientific basis for this. There's no social, ethical or moral basis for this either. Now, in terms of Michael Hunter, he 
should have been fighting Hergovic, let's be honest. I don't necessarily blame him if we're talking about, as a fan, I wanted to have seen that fight, right? That is a straight up duck. But from a tactical perspective, I've always felt that Hergovic was all wrong for him. But I feel as though he could potentially depose some of the other top heavyweights because styles make fights. A lot of people say this, but they don't actually believe it. He's very, very good in the in sudden raids from the outside. And he's a, a big puncher. He does carry power. And so against bigger, more cumbersome guys who aren't quite as agile, he can cause them a lot of problems. So had he lost to Hergovic, he would have been in that who needs him club, right? So he decided to focus more on a tactical approach when it came to his career I imagine rather than going down the the difficult route now as I said as a fan we don't want to see that we want to see all the best fight the best we don't like to see ducking but if I was part of his management team if I was part of his matchmaking team I would have advised him to do the same thing I'm just keeping it real I'm being honest with you so he went down the route of fighting Mike Wilson he's taken out Mike Wilson it's raised his position in the rankings too it was a lovely uh, slip and then counter right hand you could see the end of it there it was a, a big shot that took the guy out and you could just see that Michael Hunter is going to continue to offer a lot of problems to a lot of top class fighters and we really need to start demanding that they will fight each other but he's just showing that he really is a guy you need to keep an eye on if he's matched in the right way he can cause a whole bunch of these big big names that many people seem to think are unbeatable a whole host of problems now, moving on from Mr. Michael Hunter, let's talk about Pacquiao, Spence and Floyd Mayweather. I guess you could say the mind games have begun and so has everyone given their opinion on this as the hype begins to build. The rumours are that Floyd Mayweather could be helping out Errol Spence. Now, this is nothing new. We've heard this sort of thing before from about Floyd Mayweather. You know, there was talk about him helping Anthony Joshua and so on and so forth. So I take it all with a pinch of salt. But nonetheless, Pacquiao has responded with uh, saying that he doesn't think Floyd can help Errol Spence. Errol Spence knows what he's doing, says Manny Pacquiao. He's fighting with a YouTuber just to earn money and I'm fighting the best to add to my legacy. So that's different. To fight an easy opponent for the money or to fight one of the best to add to your legacy is different. I can easily fight an easy opponent or non-boxers. I can easily pick up an easy win, but I pick the best because I want to add to my legacy of accomplishment. It's a challenge, especially because he's taller than me. We have a strategy that we can use against the Southpaw. I know he's always coming inside and wanting to fight toe to toe, so that's good. Interesting that he said that at the end because Timothy Bradley has also given his opinion on this and he believes, and I quote, if Spence can keep the fight outside, he should have no problem beating Pacquiao. That's interesting, right? Because obviously Pacquiao's speciality is closing the range. He also said Errol Spence is relaxed in the beginning. If you go back and watch Danny Garcia, Danny Garcia got off to a good start. I thought Spence made the adjustment in the second round. Manny's speed in the beginning is going to be difficult, but once Errol is able to figure out the distance and the range, the fight is going to be a lot easier for him. Um, he Pacquiao's 85% is better than other guys 90% he still has the speed and the punch and power Spence is going to be surprised just how tenacious this guy is even though he's 42 and has been in the game for a very long time I believe this is his 26th year in the sport I never got used to it at all his herky-jerky style is what makes him innovative inside the ring the guy keeps you on edge you think he'll attack you and he'll foot faint uh, the fate, then faint you with his hands. You're just constantly burning up energy just standing in front of him. I find that very, very interesting as an interview. He's saying that essentially he believes that Errol Spence will be able to do what he was never able to do. He's basically saying, yeah, if he keeps it on the outside and he has the ability to adjust, he'll have no problem beating Pacquiao. And he's saying, although Pacquiao's 42 years old, he will surprise him early on. And we know Spence's slow start. He's saying, but that he'll adjust, even though that was something that Timothy Bradley was never able to get used to. Now, you might be saying, well, maybe that's because he's 42 years old and he obviously just thinks that Manny's no longer the fighter he used to be. And he's clearly made the reference to the fact that he believes that Pacquiao's maybe 85% of the fighter he used to be, but even that 85% is better than most other guys, 90%. In which case, he'd have to come up against the guy who has a higher ceiling than him at this current moment in time. And maybe that's what he thinks about Errol Spence. Based on this interview, though, is this him trying to, I don't know, appease both guys and make a, 
a, a case for both men. If you were to read between the lines, who do you think Timothy Bradley's picking here? It sounds like he's picking Errol Spence, right? But let me know what you think. Is this going to be a harder fight than people are envisaging? Or do you think that Manny is so past his best because at 42 years old, on a guy that relies on speed, it's not his only attribute, but spree, speed and that frenetic tempo was a massive part of his game. At 42 years old, it's more than likely that he's not going to be capable of doing the things he used to be able to do. And he could just get old, significantly older, overnight. Now, if that happens, obviously that would be a terrible thing to see because you don't really want to see great fighters go out in a terrible, terrible manner. If it's time to pass on the torch, it's time to pass on the torch. But you hope that he gives a good account of himself. But could he give such a good account of himself that he overcomes Errol Spence? Is it possible that Errol Spence will not be able to adjust or get used to the herky-jerky style and the speed of Manny Pacquiao, just like Timothy Bradley says? Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I want to hear all your opinions on all the things we've discussed. Please hit that like button, that subscribe button and that notifications button and I'll chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.